I'm with Zeke Housefather of Berkeley Earth, who's going to talk about his new poster on presentation here today. Uh, a new high-resolution, homogenized CONUS temperature data set for climate analysis from 1850 to the present for the United States. Zeke, what was the uh, purpose of this investigation? So, previously, the only high-resolution data set available for climate analysis was something called PRISM. In fact, you can see it's 30-year trends right here. The problem with PRISM, and the people who make it acknowledge this, is that the data is not fixed for things like station moves, time of observation changes, instrumental changes, all these other what are called inhomogeneities, which can create non-physical patterns. And you'll notice that PRISM shows some very strange behavior over 30 years. You have regions that are warming by half a degree within 50 kilometers of regions that are cooling by half a degree. And there's very basic thermodynamic reasons to expect that that behavior is not physically realistic. So what we did is we put together a new data set that's the same high spatial resolution, so one pixel for every 25 kilometers and, and a set of temperature readings every 25 kilometers, uh, but has much more consistent spatial fields. And we did that through using the Berkeley process, but downscaling it uh, to deal with the much more high resolution data we have in the US. So we used about 20,000 stations just in the US uh, to provide a quarter degree gridded data set. What stations were those that you included that weren't normally included in previous data sets? So the majority of the stations that we're using are in what's called GHCN Daily, um, Global Historical Climatological Network Daily, which is a somewhat new data set that NOAA has been putting together. Uh, most groups previously have either used GHCN Monthly, like NASA's GIS, or USHCN, the US Historical Climatological Network, um, which is only about 1,200 stations. Uh, there's also a number of other stations from International Surface Hourly, from Global Summary of the Day, GSOD, uh, from the, the uh, CRN, the Climate Reference Network, uh, and a few other data sets that are generally not used uh, in, in previous analyses. How did you integrate the Climate Reference Network since it only had a very short period of data? So one nice thing about the Berkeley method is, unlike some other methods that use a common anomaly period and have to toss out any station records that don't fall within the common anomaly period, we use the least squares combination method to combine station records optimally, which means we can use much more short length records than other data sets, um, which is one of the main reasons we, we can use so much data, because a lot of these data sets don't have 30, 50, 100 year records. A lot of them are, are much shorter than that. Okay. And what were your findings of this project? So the major output of the project was the data set itself, which is now available on the Berkeley Earth website uh, for both absolute temperatures and anomalies, uh, max, min, and T average, for every month from uh, 1850 to present. Uh, we also found that the outputs uh, were much more consistent with reanalysis products, which are run off weather models. Uh, so they give spatial structure of both anomalies and trends that are more consistent with reanalysis than they are with some of the other surface data projects which sort of increases our confidence that what we're producing is sort of more climatologically real than what some of the other groups like PRISM in the past have produced. And, and this sort of data should be much better for long-term climate analysis uh, than things like PRISM. I noticed that up on your graphs right here, uh, it shows the temperature record from 1850 to 2012 on the left and the 1979 to 2012 on the right. But there's no error bars on either of them. Why is that? So we do have error bars for the Berkeley record. Uh, the main reason it's not plotted on here itself is because the graphs are already pretty noisy and it would make it a little harder to see the other lines. Uh, but if you go onto our website and download the data, it all comes with error estimates, both on an aggregate level and on an individual grid cell level uh, for each month. Okay. Uh, we've always been really focused on trying to produce the most realistic error estimates possible, uh, something that not all the other groups have really done in the past. Um, Will this particular poster make it into a paper? Hopefully. Uh, we're definitely releasing the data sets. Uh, we're planning on submitting a paper. Uh, we also discovered recently that our friends at the NCDC are, are doing a very similar project using GHCN Daily, which includes much of the same data. Uh, so we'll need to talk to them. We'll need to see their paper that's currently being reviewed and figure out how much we're adding to that and what the differences between our results and their results are. Because one, one of the challenges with getting papers published is you really need to have something novel. Uh, and if they do as good a job we, as we've done, or we think we've done here, uh, we'll have to see what the marginal utility of another data set is. But we're definitely releasing the data and hopefully we're going to be publishing a paper as well based on it. What was the most surprising result that you found of this work? Um, I was really amazed at just how much difference there is between the temperature trends of the different data sets out there. Uh, particularly reanalysis products have some very weird spatial structures of cooling and warming 
that are not necessarily seen in, say, NASA GIS or even the satellite records. Um, similarly, it was pretty impressive just how much speckling and variation there was in the raw data on PRISM. Uh, and I think, you know, we might not always agree on exactly how homogenization is done, but I think this sort of thing shows the need for something at least to deal with a lot of uh, stations that have problems associated with station moves, time of observation changes, and all these other factors. I noticed the NAR data set has some strong divisions here that don't seem to be at all natural. Any yeah. explanation for what that might be? So I, I, I had a few emails back and forth with the reanalysis folks, mostly at, more at MARA than NAR. Uh, they were just a little bit more responsive. Uh, but they suggested that the reanalysis tries to take in a lot of different data that's not usually used for climate analysis. And some of those data sets have changed, and some of the instruments used for those have changed over time. Uh, so they suggested that uh, some caution should be used in interpreting longer-term trends in the reanalysis data because of changing data input streams and the effect that can have. Um, I'm not exactly sure why NARA has such strange cooling in the, in the western U.S., um, but I'd suggest the fact that it's so divergent with satellites and these, all the other data sets we're using suggests it's, it's probably an artifact of the, the data being used and not something that's physically real. Okay. Thanks, Nick, very much. No worries. Thank you.